Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Might be onto something here, Dallas. Thank you for those words. I was tremendously blessed so far just being here. I feel like I could have just continued to sit there and let you keep going. Um, <clears throat> before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the words that we've heard so far that spoke into our lives. Thank you for your spirit that's here, that's ministering to us, that's guiding our hearts and our lives and bringing us closer to you by your truths, revealing your truths to us. Yes, that you would use me in some small way here today, that you would speak through me, that you would quiet my heart and give me peace as I attempt to open your word and to expose some more truths to us and to just bring out some of the thoughts and some of the ideas that you have for us, Lord. We commit the next time to you as well, and we ask you to bless each one and to just take preeminence over this time, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine with me that we're sitting in a courtroom and this is the trial of a person who's accused of a crime, who's accused of a great crime of murder, of killing someone. And we're sitting there in the audience, maybe we're related to them, maybe we just know them. But we're sitting there and we've heard all the testimonies, we've heard all the arguments from both sides, and this is a jury trial, which means, or maybe for the children out there, this means that there's a group of people who have listened to the whole thing. They're called the jury, and there's about 20, 10 or 12 of them, and after they've heard all the arguments and they've seen all the testimonies, they go off into a little room, and they spend some time in there. And this might take hours, this might take days, sometimes this takes weeks to just to figure out and talk amongst, amongst themselves and to decide if the accused is in fact guilty or not guilty. And as you're sitting there in the courtroom, the jury has reach their decision. And maybe the accused is someone that's close to you or that you've known for a long time and this is a moment that you could hear a pin drop. This is a, a moment that seems to come down to a simple word or a few simple words. And the jury comes in and legend has it and I've heard it said a few times that when the jury comes in and they don't look at the accused, then that means they're going to pronounce him guilty. And so they're walking in, and everybody's kind of looking at them and seeing where their eyes are and what are they going to say. What is the leader going to say? And they find their seats, and the judge stands up and asks the foreman of the jury, do you, pro do you declare this man guilty or not guilty? And it's time for them to give an answer. And there's no sound in the courtroom. Everybody's quiet. And they're just waiting for that little statement. That's going to mean so much for so many people. Just a few simple words. That means so much. Is this man going to spend the next 20 years in prison? Is he going to be sentenced to life in prison? Is he going to be freed? What, what are they going to say? <clears throat> There's phrases that we come across like that. There's little words that we, that even throughout history, that maybe thousands of years later, we still know what this person said because it was so profound and because of this, it made so much of a difference in that, in that time. There's phrases like, give me liberty or give me death. Does anybody know who said that? Yeah, Patrick Henry. In his oration in 1775 in Virginia, on the eve of the American Revolution, it was a very influential speech, and he was standing before them, and the words, some of the, apparently not the whole transcript of the speech isn't written down, we don't know all of that he said, but a few years later someone went and they tried to gather, what, gather the things that he said and figure out how it went, and this is one of the things, give me liberty or give me death, and this, hundreds of years later, this is still something we know. There's still a few words that we know happened those many, so many years ago. 
because they made such a difference. They swayed so many people. They inspired so many people. I have a dream. Who said that? Does anybody know? Lots of people. Okay. <clears throat> There's a few more like that. One small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Autumn knows them all. <laughs> you want to tell us who said that? Yeah, on the moon. There's another one. Yesterday, December 7, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. This is said by Franklin D. Roosevelt. And the day after Japan attacked the United States on Pearl Harbor. One more. Let, let them eat cake. Who said that? <laughs> Who was it? Marie Antoinette, yeah. Let them eat cake. <laughs> we laugh at it now, but there's, a, there's much that could be said about that, and, and it has a lot of meaning behind it for the time that it was set in. My title for this morning, I'm going to have to hurry along here, my title for this morning is Words Matter. Words Matter. And I could uh, relate with some of the things that Dallas started out by saying in that some, sometimes with our words, it's almost like there's a pull that's drawing us to say the wrong thing. It's almost like there's that evil. And where sometimes we feel like we're chained to the, to the mass, so to speak with the things that we say or can't say. So this is a battle that's real for us. Um, I'm going to be skipping some things here. I did a quick search on the internet, and I, I was trying to find, just maybe by some random people, some profound things that they've heard, just to give us some examples about things that, were, that changed their life. And I came across a few that were very interesting. Someone said that his uncle told him, or his grandfather told him, that everyone you meet knows something you don't. So you should treat everyone as a teacher around you. And I think this is true. I haven't quite thought it through, but I think this is true. Everyone you meet knows something that you don't. Someone else said that depression presents itself in the guise of rational thought. This is the man's uncle told him this. And then uh, there's another quick story that I came across by a, uh, this is a 13-year-old girl. She was trying to teach her six-year-old daughter how to swim, and she was in the swimming pool, how to dive into a swimming pool from the side of the pool. It was taking a while as her sister was really nervous about it, and they were at a big public pool. And there was a woman, quite old, about 75 years old, slowly swimming laps. Occasionally she would stop and she would watch them, and the girl was trying to get her sister to dive in. And the younger girl just kept saying, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid, I don't want to do it. And the old woman looked at my sister and raised her fist defiantly in the air and said, so be afraid and do it anyway. And this person remembers those words many, many years later because they had such an effect on her. They changed her life. There's another one This. This man, one of his chores as a boy was to empty his dishwasher. And he remembers this as a grown man now. And he was 10 years old. And he was trying to do it fast so he had more time to play. And only his dad was home. And he was grabbing the coffee pot that was in the dishwasher. And it slipped out of his hand and crashed. It fell to the floor. And he was ashamed. And he was afraid of his dad's reaction. Like he was really afraid. And it took all my courage, he says, to go see my dad and tell him, but I did. I was almost crying of shame while still having the handle of the pot in my hand as proof. My dad calmly looked at me and said, breaking something happens when you work, that's okay, don't worry. And he says, it's silly, but I think of that almost every day. It's okay to make, mistake, to make a mistake. At least you're trying to do something. I've got a few more statements here. This is for the children, maybe. If you're eight years old and younger, you can, you can answer this, or you can raise your hand and see if you can... See if you know who said this. These are from the Bible. 
Who said, this is a really easy one, you should know this. Who said it is finished? Do you know that? Jesus? Right. That's right. Here's another one. Am I my brother's keeper? You in the back there. That's right, Cain. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know that one? You know that? Do you know who said that? Okay. Anybody else? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yep. Yeah. He might have said it, but the person I'm thinking of is John the Baptist. That was before, before Jesus was there. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How about this one? Take a sword and divide the child in two. Who said that? Yes, Tobias. Solomon, that's right. Who said this? Thy people shall my people be. Anybody know that one? Ruth, that's correct. Thank you. Is not the arrow beyond thee? You know that, Lincoln? Is not the arrow beyond thee? Lincoln? Yeah. Good. Ye are spies. Who said that? I'll give you a hint. He said it to his brothers. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Who was the man? Sometimes our words, they turn around and they bite us, don't they? Who was the man who wanted to kill somebody, and he even had a tall gallows bill to hang this man. And it turned out, this is for the children as well, and it turned out that he had to be hung on that himself. Do you know that? <coughs> Haman, yes, thank you. Sometimes our words turn around and bite us. <coughs> I heard a story a while back. I don't know if this, I guess it could be true. I mean, it probably is. Um, I'm going to get some of the details wrong if it is true. But this person, this boy, wanted really badly to have these shoes. And his mom said to him that he cannot... He's not allowed to buy the shoes. He can't do it. No, nope. he's not buying them. And so the boy went out and did it anyway. And he came home and his mother found out about it. And she was really upset with him and she said something to him like, the way I heard it was that his feet will dry up. Your feet are going to dry up. You shouldn't have done this. And she placed, it seems like, this curse on him. And years later, the same boy, um, if I remember correctly, he was in the army and there was an accident or there was, he was shot or something happened to him. And he ended up being paralyzed from the waist down and never walked again. And so it seems like almost prophetically his mother said this to him and it came true. Now, I don't know about you, but to have this hanging on you and to wonder for the rest of your life, did I, did, did my words do that? I think there's, there's a repentance that can come and, there, and Jesus can heal a person's heart who has fallen into that, who's, who's, uh, who's in that situation. But it's good for us to remember that our words have power. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wow. <clears throat> it seems like these days our, wor our, uh, our words don't seem to have as much weight as, as in times past. I'll give you an example. At, at my workplace, we... we uh, we sell uh, agricultural parts, a lot of them. And for me, I sometimes do quotes and I put together systems and sometimes I give a person a price and they have to decide if they want to buy it. And I've kind of gotten into the habit of when I'm doing that to, even though we've agreed on the phone maybe that they're going to go ahead and purchase it and then I'm going to order it for them and they're going to buy it. I've kind of gotten into the habit of getting things in writing. I'll just send them a... A quick quote and they're just, okay, I'll just ask them, just respond to the email so I have it in writing. I've kind of gotten into the habit of doing that. And 
I'm not saying that that's a wrong thing to do. I actually, I actually kind of like doing that because then it, both parties are very clear with what's, what the transaction is. They know they're going to think twice before they respond to the email. They're not just saying something flippantly. Or, so I kind of like that, but it's, it's still, it reminds me that our words don't seem to matter that much, do they, sometimes? <clears throat> I don't believe this is the way that God intended for it to work, though, for our words to be so loose and to be so meaningless. The, what did Jesus say about our speech in opposition to that very thought? He said that let, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. We can be deceived sometimes by, and I find myself even in, the, in there sometimes, that I can say whatever, but it's, at the end of the day, it's what's on paper that counts. And I thought things like that, and I kind of try to reason myself out of it. But we have to be careful because our words do hold eternal value. Our words are important. Words matter. <clears throat> and sometimes you have a little thought experiment. I don't know, maybe you've done this as well, where when you think about, about the world and all that's in the world and all the people and all the decisions they're making, and that somehow each person has free will, and that somehow God already knows what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen, and yet I can say a word, and you can say a word, that can change a person's life, there's judges and kings that can say a word that will take somebody's life. And somehow in all that, there's still free will and there's still God being all-powerful. And my mind just, I don't know, I just can't think through all that. I kind of break down. But with that thought in mind, our words are very powerful. A word you say can influence somebody for the rest of your life. A judgment you place on somebody can affect their whole lives. Eve, tempt, Eve uh, in the story of Adam and Eve that we all know, it was Eve's words that caused Adam to sin, in a sense, wasn't it? It was something she said to him. It was something with her mouth. Yes, he's at fault for doing it. Yes, she's at fault for doing for eating in the first place. But the thing kept going with the things that with uh, words, with communication that they had with each other. And just another illustration of how powerful our words are. Remember the Tower of Babel. What did God do to stop all progress and to totally disrupt the Tower of Babel being built? He blocked their communication. He made them not understand each other. Couldn't he have also made all their arms useless for that generation? Or couldn't he have also, I don't know, made the bricks not stick together? Or couldn't he have made them all blind? Or, But it's interesting to think how powerful the communication, that, how powerful that intercommunication is with one another. And in fact, it, it caused that whole thing to fall apart and the people to scatter just by blocking the way they understood each other's words. Jesus sets a very high standard for our speech. In Matthew twelve thirty six. he says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew twelve thirty seven. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by your words thou shalt be condemned. <clears throat> In Colossians 3.8, it reads, But now ye also put off all these anger, Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. We get into a lot of trouble with our words sometimes, don't we? They can, uh, what does James say? I'm going to read that in a minute, actually. The, 
Sometimes at work, people will walk up to my desk and they'll say something to me like, Dennis, stop making so much noise. Um, I'm not a person who talks a whole lot, but it's <laughs> amazing to me in spite of that and how much trouble I've gotten with some of the things that I've said. How many times I've had to repent of something I said. And how many times I've had to say I'm sorry for this or... And there's also this, uh, there's also, I mean, I'm certainly not advocating for everybody to be quiet uh, or as quiet as I am. I like that people talk and I don't mind sitting in a crowd and just listening. Um, so I'm certainly not advocating for everybody to be like that. But it's an amazing thought to me, like, with how little I say, how much trouble I still manage to get myself into. We can sin against God with our words. In James 3, I'm going to read James 3, 1 to 14. He has a lot to say there about our speech and taming the tongue. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that... Uh, I could probably skip some of this. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. <clears throat> if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire can live. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so that so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Wow, that's some really strong language. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue no man can tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs, so that no fountain both yields set salt water and fresh? If you think of the There's a number of times, I think, that I heard the verses in Isaiah chapter 6 um, spoken across the pulpit and read here. Um, I'll just read them over quickly. In the year King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Sorry, he said, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isn't it interesting what stands out to him, to Isaiah there? Isn't it interesting that he doesn't say, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean hands. Or woe is me for all the evil things that I've heard with my ears. Look at all the things that I've done. Woe is me for all the things that I've seen. Why doesn't he say anything like that? Why does he say that? Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Our words have a lot of power. And we can fall into great trouble with our words. I was reminded of the unpardonable sin, something that, I mean, I guess you could say you can live a lifestyle of blasphemy, but isn't the unpardonable sin, isn't the, um, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, isn't that something that we say, that we do with our words? It's amazing how much we can, how much harm we can do with the things that we say. 
I thought of the story of Ananias who sold some possessions and then lied about the, about, how, about I think, how does it go? He lied about what he was keeping back, or he lied about the price so that he could keep some of it back. And then he fell and was dead right there, and then his wife came in and did the same thing. And it almost seems to me like they were giving her a chance to, when, when the question was asked, I have it written down here actually, when the question was asked of her, I'll read Acts 5, 7. When his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her and said, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. It seems to me like she had just a little, one more chance right there. The thing had already been done so to speak, with her hands. But could she not have repented there? Could she not have changed her, the rest of her history by saying something else? Just with something she said. Yes, she already sinned by, by agreeing to do this, but still, it's amazing how much of it comes down to a few words that we say, isn't it? We sin against each other with our words, we hear messages on that. We've heard messages recently on murmuring. We've heard messages on uh, lying. We've heard messages on gossip. There is so much harm that can be done with the things that we say. Matthew fifteen eleven says, when, uh, when Jesus was accused there of not washing his hands before he ate, according to the law of the time, or I think this was not a... A mosaic law. I think this was something that the Pharisees had initiated, I want to say. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But he said it's not what we put into our mouths that defile us. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. In Matthew 15, 11, that's right. It's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. So knowing all this, how should we walk? Should we just be quiet and be sort of tied to the mast, as Dallas put it, and not say anything and just be afraid of everything that comes out of our mouth? In James 3, chapter 10, he writes, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Out of the same mouth we bless people and we curse people. Our words have power. Let's be careful whether we bless or whether we curse with them. There was a woman living in Germany in the late 1930s. We'll call her Sarah. <clears throat> she was living with her husband and two small children. And it was a very bad situation for the Jews living there. Things were getting worse. And she, she wanted to get out of the country with her family and escape the Nazi menace. But how to do it? There seemed no answers. Then a glimmer of hope. Word reached her that there were some visas that Jews could get from an office in Berlin the next day. Her husband had to work. So after finding somebody to watch the children, and with strong resolve, Sarah boarded the train the next morning for the hour-long ride in the heat of the summer, hopefully to get what she needed for her family. Without those visas, she did not know what she would do. When she arrived in Berlin, she took a cab to the address she had where the visas were said to be available inside the building. She found the right office, and when she entered, she saw dozens of people in a hot, cramped waiting room waiting for the same salvation that she was there for. A lone German bureaucrat sat at a desk, seemingly oblivious to the mass of people that were around him. Hours passed, and people suffered in silence. Sarah held on to the hope that she would leave that office with those few pieces of paper that would mean a new life for her and her family. Absent those visas, she simply didn't know what she would do. Suddenly everyone was snapped out of their heat, aided melancholy by the shrill voice of the bureaucrat. No visas today, come back tomorrow. The thought of going through this same ordeal the next day weighed heavily on everybody's minds. But considering the lack of other options, they resolved to be back in the morning for 
Sarah, and perhaps many others, it meant the unexpected challenge of finding lodging on such short notice. But with so much at stake, Sarah persevered to find a room for the night. With the sun rising came the double-edged emotions of hope and fear. As Sarah once again walked into that crowded, stifling office, she no doubt tried to keep hopeful, despite not knowing how many visas would be available, and if there were even enough for everyone. Again, for hours and hours, people suffered in silence in the hot office. The bland bureaucrat remained silent as well as he did paperwork and just ignored the people around him. <clears throat> in the late afternoon, the silence was broken by another loud announcement by the bureaucrat. His words brought instant heartbreak to those assembled. <clears throat> there are no visas. Everyone must go home, he said. After the shock of his words was absorbed, people responded by letting out their pent-up emotions. Complaint after complaint was voiced. Some with raw anger mixed with utter despair. Sarah no doubt felt the weight of the world on her shoulders. Her fate and that of her family had hung in the balance. Now very hot and tired, she tried to make the long trip home with nothing to show for it. Did Sarah join in with the chorus of despair directed at the bureaucrat? If so, no one would blame her. What she did, though, was quite different. She wended her way slowly through the crowd and walked right up to where the man was sitting. She leaned over and said to him, I want to thank you for all of your time. Have a good day. She wended her way slowly through the crowd and walked right up to where the... No, this is double over here. She started to walk out of the building. And almost at the stairway, when she heard the thud of shoes running towards her, she turned and saw that it was the man who had been sitting there. He was holding pieces of paper in his hand. I have these visas I can give you, he said. And that's how she was able to get out of her family, to get out of Europe with her family. <clears throat> it's amazing how much we can accomplish and how much a kind word can do and the change that can make in someone. Just a moment of understanding and kindness changed her life forever. Saved her life, we could say. We sometimes have these high ambitions and then we... <clears throat> Monday comes around and we're... Right back to where we were, isn't it go like that? The famous boxer, Mike Tyson, said that everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. <laughs> everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. Until Monday morning comes around. But there's ways we can prepare ourselves. There is a state of mind that we can be in before we come into the situation that will help us once we reach it. Uh, James 1, verse 18. Out of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, hearing, the word, hearing and doing the word. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. There's a man that... Um, I've got to get my story straight here, just a second. This morning at a train stop near the hospital, this story goes, a man and his three young children got on. The kids were loud and completely out of control, running from one end of the train car to the other. An annoyed passenger sitting next to me looked over at the man and asked, is there a reason you're letting your kids go nuts right now? The man looked up with tears in his eyes and said, the doctor just told me their mother isn't going to make it. Sorry, I'm just trying to think before we all sit down at home to talk about this. And of course, the annoyed passenger was speechless. We don't know. We don't know what people are going through. You don't know the reason for the situation in front of you. You don't know all the ins and outs of everyone's life. Let's be careful with our speech. <clears throat> for myself, I'm, I find for some reason, I think I know the reason, in the week, week or two leading up to preaching that I'm, I feel like I'm more tempered 
at home and some of the things that I see, even though I'm under more stress because I'm anticipating having to speak. And I guess it's, I'm spending more time in prayer, I'm spending more time in the Word, and that's where my mind is, and my mind is trying to connect with God and being close to God. And sometimes when a situation does arise, I feel like I'm, I'm able to handle it a little bit better. I'm able to be more tempered because of the state that my mind is in, because of the state my heart is in, because of the closeness that I have with God in that moment. And so the state that we're in when we, when we come up to the situation affects how we deal with it. How many times have you seen where the proverb comes true, a soft answer turneth away wrath? When you're in a situation and emotions may be high and tempers may be flaring, <clears throat> and then somebody in the corner says something very quietly and humbly, and it just seems to let all the air out of the room, doesn't it? Have you seen that? I've witnessed that. A kind answer, a soft answer, turneth away wrath. <clears throat> now, I don't want to come across as leaving us under condemnation or um, I think there is room for humor. We had a good discussion here after the message a few weeks ago. There is room for humor, but we ought to be careful with how far we let it go and where that line is. <clears throat> and even figures of... I thought of... Uh, it used to be a little bit... I think I was under condemnation even of um, with things like exaggerating and and people using figures of speech thought it was lying, I guess. Um, I think there's room for some of that. There's room for figures of speech. There's room for alliteration. I believe the Bible even uses some alliteration. I jotted one down in 1 Kings 4.20. It says that Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Well, I don't think they were as many as the sand by the sea. So... I think there's room for some of these things as well in our conversation. I don't think we need to be walking under condemnation and under so much pressure that we're afraid to say anything. <clears throat> Another one was how, how big an army did Joshua, Joshua face on the northern campaign? A great army in number, like the sand on the seashore. That's Josiah 11.4. <clears throat> I was rushing through some things in the beginning. I guess I could have gone more slowly, but... I'm almost coming to the end here. So just to recap, words matter. They can affect people. They can affect your brother's life or eternity. Words matter. And there can be eternal danger in our words. <clears throat> and I hope that we can take this and be encouraged and not to be under condemnation, but we can be encouraged and if you find yourself, like me, many times falling short, that <clears throat> there's wisdom. There's wisdom in here for dealing with that. And there's one who gives wisdom liberally and without reproach. And for a clear closing verse, Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers.